Is my field of uh, study is facial perceptiveness, is mental disorders and rhinoplasty and uh, quality of life, how the things we do affect the patient. So not much as a surgeon uh, perspective, but more on the patient's perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're in season three where we're doing live interviews and coming to you directly from Berlin at the International Meeting of Global Masters of Rhinoplasty. And I'm very excited for today's episode because this is a man who I've been trying to track down for a while, has got some <laughs> fascinating insights to rhinoplasty and the research that he does, etc. So um, a big warm welcome to Jem Bullitt. Thank, Thank you, you so much, so much Thanks for, being for having here. me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. So Jem, yeah, man, there's so much to ask you about. Talk to me about sex and rhinoplasty. Oh no, I thought we were skipping that part. <laughs> Well, the thing that you're mentioning is that we uh, looked into um, if uh, sex with orgasm can actually have a positive effect on the nasal breathing. And it turns out that it has, and that it has the same effect for about an hour, um, the same as a nasal decongestant. So when we published it, it went crazy and um, uh, won a few prizes, which were uh, famous. So um, it made it to the media and then it got huge. So yeah, basically it's just physiology. I mean, yeah. uh, saying that um, when you have uh, like a sportive activity and sex is a sportive activity, uh, uh, a nice one with uh, uh, with a special uh, uh, orgasm uh, uh, at the end and that just has an uh, effect on your nervous system and it uh, triggers certain receptors that cause your nasal mucosa to de-swell like uh, in the same way a nasal, uh, nasal decongestant does. And uh, so sometimes you don't even need a nasal decongestant and there's some other solutions that you should consider. <laughs> so, Jim, you know, one of the things that we've been uh, chatting about is the whole like psychological and mental right. side of rhinoplasty. Right. Yeah. But before we climb into that, maybe just tell the listeners a little bit more about who you are, where do you come from, yeah. uh, what do you do? Yeah. Well, um, as I said, my name is Jem. Um, I'm, I was born and raised in a, uh, in a, a town in Germany called Karlsruhe. I studied in Heidelberg, which is not far uh, away. And uh, my uh, studies and uh, uh, clinical research uh, took me all over uh, the world, but I always came back to Heidelberg and I'm working currently in Mannheim. So what I focus on uh, is my field of uh, study is facial perceptiveness, is mental disorders and rhinoplasty and uh, quality of life, how the things we do affect the patient. So not much as a surgeon uh, perspective, but more on the patient's perspective. So I'm, uh, I'm uh, using a lot of patient reported outcome measures. We're validating them. We're getting new ones just to make sure that our patients are um, getting um, hopefully the best treatment uh, they can have. So we're evaluating all the time and see what we can do better. Yeah, but I mean, you're very into research and stuff, but you're still operating. I mean... Oh yeah, you, that's you, my main you, part. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, so that's my main part. Yeah. So I have my... Uh, our focus group at the University of Heidelberg, where uh, I'm a professor, and um, but I'm um, my I'm doing rhinoplasty and facial plastic surgery. That's yeah. like the, yeah. the main thing, yeah. But it's a nice combination. I like both, and um, yeah, I, I I like the combination. And you were telling me that you actually initially thought you were going to specialize in a different field of medicine. Yeah, I actually wanted to do a cardiothoracic surgery as well. Um, I was very excited. I did my doctoral thesis in uh, thoracic surgery. I went to uh, Baylor to University of Texas Heart Institute and trained with uh, Dr. Cooley and Dr. Duncan. Yeah. Um, so very famous uh, surgeons uh, for cardiothoracic and in the specialty. Um, and the question that comes up is why didn't I pursue in this, uh, in this field? And it's difficult to say, it's just the, um, so we come back again to quality of life. So, um, in Germany, it's very rare to, uh, to talk and see a cardiothoracic surgeon who's genuinely happy with his life and the quality of life that they have. And, uh, that was a consideration that I took in a very, very early stage in my career to not go into the field that I actually really adore. I still adore facial plastic surgery. I love everything I do. Yeah. But at the beginning, um, I was tending more towards cardiothoracic surgery and pediatric surgery because like seeing the uh, heart transplant or a little yeah. heart beating from a, from a child, it, I think it was the most fascinating thing I ever experienced in my yeah. life. And uh, it was hard letting go, but I don't regret it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And um, I know off air we were chatting a little bit about like 
body dysmorphic disorder yeah. and difficult patients. Huge but part. I think I want to hear more about that. Well, so um, in the last few years, uh, my research is more on mental disorders uh, and psychiatric disorders that can affect our um, our patients, and it's uh, anxiety, depression, and as you mentioned, body dysmorphic disorder. Um, so um, we all, everyone, every, everybody has, we talked about that yesterday, everybody has this one patient that um, they missed uh, with the diagnosis of BDD, and um, it's just so energy consuming and so exhausting, and it can, uh, if you if you fail to detect this uh, kind of uh, mental disorder, it, uh, it's not just uh, an unhappy result for the patient, but it's unhappy result for the surgeon as well. It can be devastating and um, it can ruin your career, it can ruin your personal life and uh, you can't sleep if you're thinking about the patient and get messages or calls every every five seconds, every five minutes. So it's also something that uh, to protect the surgeons uh, that should know about. So what we found out is um, that BDD patients don't do very well in sense of quality of life mm. gaining after surgery. They are impaired mm -hmm. and they start with a lower quality of life before surgery. So um, they really suffer. They, they really, really, really suffer. It's a disease. And um, this is nothing new. I mean, in, in uh, some, somewhere around 1860, uh, a professor from Italy, Morselli, found this disease and uh, he called it dysmorphobia. And he said that these patients are truly miserable. This is one of the quotes that uh, lasted for over 150, uh, dec uh, 150 years yeah, now. Yeah. And um, there is actually treatment for that, uh, like cognitive behavioral therapy or a medication yeah, actually yeah. Uh, but um, these patients don't do well after surgery so they they uh, might have slight defects or flaws but um, they tend to overestimate it and um, they really um, yeah it's difficult to, to treat them because you don't you can't really win even so if you treat their nasal symptoms, they're still going to... Because rhinoplasty is so much more than just treating the nasal airway. It's yeah. about mental health. It's about uh, uh, your uh, self-consciousness, uh, self uh, general symptoms. And all that taking in, in, uh, in consideration, you sometimes don't help these patients. And um, how, how do you... What's your advice to the listeners about trying to not get these patients on the <laughs> one hand but the other hand is once you've got that how do you as a physician what kind of stuff yeah. would you say is a is a good way to protect your own mental health yeah. well i'm i'm always evolving so i wouldn't consider myself an an, an expert uh, who who has finished uh, who's done this training for 60 years and knows how to treat every patient most people say trust your gut feeling that's yeah. what you, when you hear uh, the American surgeons uh, talking about their 60 years of experience, mm -hmm. but uh, some people don't have that gut feeling. If you haven't done uh, 50,000 surgeries mm -hmm. uh, before, mm -hmm. you don't have this gut feeling. And, and gut feeling is, as research shows, always something that you experience before. So you have to experience certain stuff to get this gut feeling. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you so, pay your dues, eh? Yeah, so, so um, what... Can always uh, I can always well everybody does this mistake I always I also operated on patients that I shouldn't have and everybody uh, every uh, surgeon who really uh, would probably uh, answer the question the same way that you missed some part mm -hmm. uh, of physical uh, of uh, psychiatric disorders that you should have probably noticed but my advice is um, because it's my field of study and. Um, if you want to read more into it, if you have problems with that, the uh, expert in the world, worldwide um, expert is Catherine Phillips. Yeah. And she's, wrote, uh, she's written an excellent book uh, called uh, The Broken Mirror. So if you're interested in this field... So that, you'll be able to get that on Amazon or whatever. Everywhere. Yeah. The yeah. Broken Mirror. Yeah. yeah okay. I don't have any disclosure. And, and, I don't get any money. It's just... Uh, no, no, sure. But just, who is she? Catherine Phillips is a professor um, currently, I think, in the US. And uh, she uh, specialized in body dysmorphic disorder okay. and especially in surgery and body dysmorphic disorder and um, uh, and she published uh, the most uh, cited uh, manuscripts uh, in this area actually so what she tells you is that you um, probably many people uh, that would tell you is um, if you as a surgeon feel like there is somebody who has body dysmorphic disorder and you want to let them go well first of all you can actually try and tell them uh, that there's something wrong, but this is really, they don't want to hear that most of the time. So um, you have to say that you understand them and you have to agree that they're suffering. You have to see mm -hmm. that they're suffering. Mm -hmm. So a, a good way is to try and maximize your empathy, saying, I understand that you have a problem and I understand that you're really, really suffering, but it must be hard for you. 
and this is a good um, start off to get a connection between the patient and you even if you have a different goal if you just want to don't I don't want to operate I just want uh, her or him gone but still this is a good way to empathy and you could talk about uh, possible therapies that um, they could uh, they could actually uh, get and gain from yeah, that yeah. and if you don't want to get the surgery we just had this talk over the last uh, weeks with other master surgeons and they said actually that they don't say, uh, don't use the word um, I don't want to operate I don't want to do your surgery is just like um, try to let them down in a different way saying um, I don't have the skills to do your surgery mm -hmm. um, like uh, more uh, more on this way. I don't know if it's the right yeah. answer. I don't yeah. know. Probably Catherine Phillips would probably disagree. Um, but um, yeah, most people actually seek help. So there are some who went through a lot of surgeons and uh, and know how to get their way uh, yeah. to surgery. Uh, um, but most of them actually, there are also some people who actually seek help. Yeah. And they're not unhappy that you, uh, but if you don't know the disease, if you don't know the conditions and how it represents, you probably yeah. um, won't catch it. And okay, different question now. Jim, what is for you the most challenging thing in rhinoplasty? The most challenging part in rhinoplasty is um, filtering the patients that I shouldn't do surgery on. Really? Yeah. And okay, so how many, say of 100 patients who come requesting rhinoplasty, yeah. would you say you have a conversion rate of how many will end up being on the table? Did I want? Not that you want, but normally if there's 100 people. Okay, so <laughs> if I turn them down or yeah, they turn me down. Yeah. What would you think? Oh, that's because good. it's interesting. I think at the early on in your career, when yeah. a patient walks in the door requesting they're going to get it. Yeah. But later on in the career, it's not quite as much. Yeah. But I'm interested to hear from your side what I you've say done in... 60%. 60%, eh? Probably, but that's, that's just out of my head. Yeah. 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 Was, I, but uh, early in my career, I would say probably more. Yeah. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't filter because I, I, I still love doing surgery, but I would try and get more surgery done. And now and now I have more options to filter and yeah. Uh, yeah. use these words that I just described, like, um, I'm probably not the best for you. Yeah. Uh, I'm not the right, I don't have the right skills for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or... Uh, something like that and and tell me touch let's touch on a bit of social media and, and mm -hmm. mental health etc for patients as well because there's this massive pressure and it's all these selfies that dis distort your face and that's yeah. the nose you want and it's difficult there's actually interesting studies showing that if people come with um, other pictures from social media and they tend to say I want this nose or can you do it like that that these patients in the study show they um, they have less quality of life after surgery even if it went well so um, these yeah. patients, uh, I don't know what the psychiatric um, issue exactly is, but um, if you uh, if you tend to uh, look at too many pictures and compare them too much, um, it doesn't help your quality of life and you don't see the result that you actually gained and more see the negative part of mm. what you probably didn't gain. So you see more the flaws than the gain. And uh, overall, you don't have the quality of life um, gain that you could have if you didn't compare yourself to others. But that, I guess, is not just in rhinoplasty, but you could uh, yeah. emphasize that in uh, other parts of your uh, of your life. Sure. And uh, how do you see rhinoplast progressing over the next while? Well, surgery wise, I'm I'm just uh, I'm never really uh, I'm 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 generally a happy guy, but I always. Um, try to get better and learn stuff so I uh, I go to Istanbul to uh, to Göksel a lot to to see and uh, do new stuff if if I read a lot and I try and see different um, surgeons and adapt what I think mm -hmm. uh, would be good for my practice I learn a lot from my colleague and friend Frank Riedel who yeah. is one of my main mentors and probably the mentor that I have so I'm very grateful that I just um, uh, met so many people that actually helped me uh, for my career and to become the surgeon that I want to be, but I'm not there. No, I don't know. I don't, uh, I always want to be improve. better. And improve, okay. So. Last thing I want to ask you about, yeah. chat about a little bit is patient related outcome measures. Yeah. So have you designed any, <laughs> do you test your patients before? Yeah, Tell we do them. We do them. I mean, it's interesting. So at the beginning, the, uh, well, patient report outcome measures are gaining more and more importance. Yeah. It's not just, um, you cannot just show pictures of the of the cases that uh, before and after. I mean, you can do that on social media, but if you want to really do it evidence-based, you need some sort of patient-reported outcome measures. And it's gaining more and more 
um, importance, especially in uh, aesthetic surgery, where the feeling of the patient should be the uh, should be the best outcome that you uh, that you can actually measure and get. So um, it started around twenty years ago, and one of the first uh, patient reported outcome measures was from Al Saraf. Uh, from the United States, and it was called the run and outcome measure. It was a basic one consisting out of six questions, but mainly uh, the most of them are just um, uh, aesthetic uh, questions. So very rare function questions so, and uh, very rare uh, mental um, self-consciousness questions. So it was a first start, but it's, uh, it, 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 it doesn't... Um, it doesn't emphasize uh, the whole surgery and the mm -hmm. whole change that the patient is mm -hmm. going through. So we uh, we uh, validated um, a questionnaire. We invented and validated a questionnaire. We designed one. It's called the Functional Rhinoplasty Outcome Inventory. We started with 22 questions in the alpha version. We did the whole psychometric and validation process. And um, 17 questions turned out to be important. So we're using that. Um, so the higher the score is, the less uh, quality of life you have. So the gain, uh, so the aim is in the surgery to actually um, get the score lower. So you have more quality of life. There are actually like 20, 30 patient reported outcome measures in the last 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's the Schnoss, there's the Utrich questionnaire. Yeah. So everybody, everyone has their f uh, pros and cons, uh, the face cue, yeah. uh, depending like uh, who promotes them. And, yeah. But there's four or five questionnaires that are really validated yeah. and are really good and these are the ones that you could use yeah. in germany for example if you're in a private practice um, sometimes you have to have a quality circle so you have to prove that you are um, uh, actually validating the quality of your surgery and your work and this is an excellent tool where you can have it yeah. you can do research with it and you can even work on yourself why is this patient not satisfied yeah. what can i do yeah, yeah. And then you have to look. You have to be self-critical, and if you if you adapt all these, then you I think actually it doesn't just help the patient; it also helps the surgeon to become a better version of himself. Yeah, jeez, Jim, it's so inspiring, man. It's good to see you <laughs> sit here and talk to guys actually pushing the envelope, trying to really get <laughs> academic, but re having the humility of saying, "How can I get better?" Yeah, you know, that's true. fantastic. That's true. So yeah. thank you, man. Yeah, thank but I you. love what you're doing, man. I love how you pursue in this academic career and how you uh, teach and teach and teach. I I cannot say I've met anybody who's so dedicated to this uh, as you are. It's really an inspiration seeing what you're doing, your podcasts, your webinars during a difficult COVID time and continuing this education. I want to thank you for doing everything. It's really inspiring and you're doing a great job. Please continue. Oh, man. Thank you. Thanks for Guys, having thank you for listening and come so back much. again next week for another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast. Thanks for having me.